I've been playing Sona for six years, okay? I've played thousands of matches. I've seen all there is to see on this champion. And right now I'm gonna tell you, nobody should play Sona, but if you're gonna play Sona, you might as well focus up and play it right. No half measures on this champion. You either learn to do it right or stop, because if you don't, you're gonna be a fucking tumor. And I have to imagine that for people who play ranked, their experience with Sona is having someone on their team lock her in and do exactly that. So there are two ways that this can happen. The first comes from the reality that not a lot of people know how to play Sona competently because Sona fucking sucks. The second comes from the fact that while Sona can be incredibly effective, the effect is subtle. It's not flashy, it doesn't happen all at once, but it happens. Little by little, Sona denies a ton of damage from the enemy team, closes gaps, and applies just a pathetic little amount of magic damage to your auto attacks. Like damn, 14 damage? It's kind of insulting. Alright, what I'm trying to do here is address the general stereotypes surrounding Sona, right? the box that Sona is put into as a champion, and the box that Sona players are put into as players. Because I think Sona is a relatively misunderstood champion compared to shit like Nautilus. Pretty easy champion to wrap your head around. Everybody who plays League knows what this means, but how many people do you think actually know what this means? Now maybe you do, and if so, good job man, you know your shit. But a lot of people don't, and so they classify Sona improperly as just another enchanter. No! Wrong. In fact, I was looking at guides just for a bit of research, and I found this one. And while I was reading up on enchanters, I was like, So you're supposed to utilize your laning phase and play aggressive to make space. Is this, is this guy on fucking crack? But it turned out Sona was actually considered a special case of enchanter in this guide. Alongside Yumi, which we'll get into this, but huge difference in laning phase between the two. Fine. Whatever, this guy is absolutely right in his classification. Though I would argue the specifics are very outdated. <laughs> your advantage is in your sustain. It's, it's, it's crack. It, ha it has to be crack, right? Sona is very strong, but she's also very weak. She's a simple champion, but she's a little complicated. And likewise, League as a game is pretty easy to play, but pretty hard to understand. Should I heal? Dude, you! This game is dog shit! In that sense, Sona is a great representation of League as a whole, but she's also a terrible representation of League as a whole. Sona, despite being one of the easiest champions in the game, is not cut and dried at all. And the people who play her aren't easily generalized either. Now, I'm pretty much the last person that you would expect to play a champion like Sona. Before I ever played League, I almost exclusively played first-person shooters, and I almost exclusively went for DPS, no medics, I played zero supports. I liked playing more independently and wielding all my power right in front of me. Sona was like the antithesis of that. She is the antithesis of how I play video games, but I've played her constantly over the years anyways for one simple reason. Do you see this? Now do you see this? Are you getting it yet? It took me a long time to start enjoying Sona and by extension League as a whole, because there was nothing fun about playing some weak fuck off no damage healer. Until one day, something just clicked. And since that point, I've had a better and better understanding of this champion, and that understanding is what I'm here to share with you today. Lazy Purple, if you really do exist, I'm sorry for stealing your titling scheme for the second time, but this one's not TF2 related, and I think that should make it okay. So with the new season coming up to change everything again, I want to talk a little bit about why I play Sona, what makes her fun, what makes her suck, and what distinguishes a shitty noob inter Sona from an experienced battle-hardened warden. Anyways, there's a couple things I have to explain in order to do all this, starting with the basics of the champion. And don't roll your eyes, because I'd bet for a majority of the League player base, the basics of Sona are far less basic than you think they are. When you're a new player, and your opponents suck, Sona definitely shines as a simple champion, because all you actually have to do is just use your abilities a lot. And that's true, no matter where you are on the ladder. But once your opponents get more experienced, this seemingly easy playstyle will become fucking impossible, because you're making a hundred mistakes per second that the enemy team will know how to punish. And some of you are sitting there and going, yeah, no shit. But you'd be surprised how many people don't understand the severe punishment for simplicity in this game, because some people don't have very powerful critical thinking skills, and that's okay. You can still play anyone in this shitty game because it's a little toy for children. We're getting off track. Eventually, you're gonna need to use all three parts of each three abilities as optimally as you can. So knowing what they do is pretty important. In the interest of time for this video, I'm just gonna cover the important stuff. Your passive does two things. It gives you a power cord every three abilities, which is an enhanced auto attack that does extra damage and applies an effect based on the last ability you used. Abilities also grant stacks from your passive, Accelerando, which I will be calling Accelerando. 
because I'm an American. These stacks grant you half a fucking point of ability haste, maxing out at 120 stacks, after which it just starts taking time off the remaining cooldown of your R. That's just Sona's passive, by the way. If I was teaching you how Lux worked, we'd be done by now. Anyways, your Q does damage. It does this damage, and it does that damage. The power cord after Q just does more damage. W does some healing and gives some shields, and the power cord after W makes the target physically smaller, and reduces their damage by 25% for 3 seconds, which is almost like using exhaust. Your E speeds you and your allies up, and the power cord after E slows the target. Your R is pretty simple, which is why Riot Freak is going to be explaining it for me. Sona's ultimate is Crescendo. It's a skill shot line nuke, making enemy champions dance in place while taking damage. Okay, so that was a long time ago. It looks like this now. I wouldn't call it a line nuke anymore. Really, it's a line stun. I mean, 50% AP scaling is fucking abysmal. Seraphine and Nami get 60%. Whatever, it's still good. It's the centerpiece to Sona's kit. And it was so weak in Wild Rift that they had to rework it. Awesome. That's most of what Sona does, covered in record time. And for most of the game, these abilities kind of feel like shit. What you need to understand is Sona contributes very, very thin margins to her team's strength with each ability. But remember, you're stacking CDR just by existing, so you can contribute these margins many times a lot, and eventually they'll start to add up. If you've ever taken calculus, it's like your abilities are DX, you're doing an infinitesimally small amount of damage or healing, but you're making up a Riemann sum under the exponential curve that is your scaling power, and you can pretend like you're a real champion that Riot hasn't power creeped out of existence. I will remind you, as Sona, you, Lulu, and Yumi are the only actual supports in the game that have to wait for level 6 to have hard CC. But Lulu has a polymorph, you don't have anything that strong in your entire kit, and Yumi is untargetable for the entire laning phase, so I think it's fair to say you have pretty much the biggest lane disadvantage. For better or worse, this is how it's supposed to be and is what Riot considers balanced for Sona, because you scale. Now, I'm gonna be square with you, the only thing you really need to worry about is the early game because the late game is pretty easy if you do well enough to make it there. Sona is referred to as a hyperscaling champion, and while I don't think the picture that paints in your head is accurate to reality, you certainly do scale. But before you do that, you have to focus on not fucking blowing it and losing the game. That first starts in champ select. I'm going to be honest, the best thing you can do here is pick someone else. Pick Thresh, or Nautilus, or Janna, or Renata. Picking Sona has a good chance of instantly tilting your team. I honestly can only recommend this champion for people who are seriously determined to play it right, knowing you have to put in a lot of work for almost no fucking reward. But that's what we Sona players do, we lock it in anyways. The game might want you to take Ignite. I love Ignite, but I hate Ignite. It never fucking casts correctly, so I have to take Exhaust. But both of these spells require you to get in cast range of the enemy to use it on them, which, for an enchanter whose best position is about right here, that doesn't make a lot of sense. So if you want to be a pussy, you could also take heal. I doubt anyone cares about runes, but for whatever reason, the recommender gives you Scorch instead of Gathering Storm. I don't know why, Gathering Storm seems way better on a scaling champion. I will say, I cannot play the game without Presence of Mind. It is insane how many mana problems on this champ are mitigated by Presence, Mana Flow Band, and Tear. And Riot just thinks that with every new season, you don't need all three of these things to make the champ playable. They are wrong. Take all three until I tell you otherwise. Also, why not take the ability haste? Riot, what the fuck is this rune page? Whatever, that's fine. Moving on. We're in the game now. I'm gonna miss the shit out of Spell Thieves because it charges way faster than this new piece of shit item that they're adding for Season 14. But this new item does change up how Sona is played, kinda, sorta, maybe. Before we get into that, take a point in Q and cast it twice to stack your passive in base. And cast it a third time after leashing if you really want to. There used to be a good reason to only go twice, so you can auto Q and then get an auto reset for your power cord to get three fast spell thieves procs. But the new support item starts with fucking zero, so save yourself the risk and just do whatever seems right. At this point with the new item, there's a little bit of time when laning starts where you still have no charges. You can use this to be a little more aggressive while the enemy waits for their charge, but I honestly recommend just saving your mana and chilling out while you're waiting for charges. Laning phase is fucking tough, you really just have to conserve all your resources and do well enough. Now, if the enemy sucks ass, you can play really aggressive and avoid being punished for it. And you'll find Sona is really good at poking and harassing, because believe it or not, once upon a time, Sona was designed to excel at lane control, with the exact same abilities she has today. I'll again let Freak explain. Starting with Mana Manipulator and Hymn of Valor, you want to abuse your early game damage output. Always cast your three spells while in base to charge Power Cord. Then, just use the brush and Sona's excellent range. Even against Taric, I'm able to consistently harass Ash. 
but that design doesn't really work anymore because League is a shit game and support is a stupid role, so most of the time you have to hunt for tiny windows to safely sneak your poke damage in, making sure to abuse the range on your Q, which is somehow really easy to punish, and honestly in a lot of cases where this is useful you can get away with an auto attack too. But you have to do this like 200 times per game, and you're instantly dead in those cases where autoing is dangerous, so all that is to say, be very mindful of your positioning and safety, but use your goddamn poke because that's all you have right now. Everyone will tell you to do this when the enemy ADC is walking up to last hit a minion because they're stuck in an auto animation standing still, and that's true, that strategy is mission critical for finishing your support quest in a timely manner. So important that both the enemy support and ADC will know that you're going for it if they're experienced. Listen, on Sona, never underestimate the lengths your enemy laners will go to deny you your support item procs. In fact, you'll notice a lot of enemies are on their fucking toes around you, camping your wards and watching your every click, holding their wind walls and dashes through hell and back just to avoid your R. People will focus on you way more than they should because they think enchanters are free kills, and once you understand that, you can use it to your advantage, which grants you the key to mastering Sona. When it comes to poking in lane, you have to do a lot of baiting, telegraphing an approach for poke, then dodging away at the last second, making use of your E speed boost. It's especially good to bait out skill shots and damaging abilities, because you can teach yourself to dodge them, but you can't teach your solo queue ADC to dodge fucking anything. And in low elo, these players just absorb skill shots endlessly, so before they go 0-10, try to steal the focus without feeding worse than they would. It's gonna cost all of your mana, it's gonna require you to do a lot of dangerous shit, but it's kinda what you have to do in Lee's current state. There are a lot of champions that are played in support that don't really belong in the role, particularly mid lane mages. And in this case, they can hit you with practically undodgeable bullshit that really isn't fair. When that happens, get boots as soon as you can and just do what you gotta do, man. You have no real sustain, you have no CC until level 6, Riot forgot about you, it is what it is. These bullshit games into mid lane mages or Pike or Senna who have been blatantly overloaded and unfair for years with no substantial changes are the games that forge a true Sona player. The lane is in their hands, but remember, the game is in yours. Unless you're against Pike, there's really not a lot of counterplay options there. Okay, this seems like a good time to get into notable support matchups for Sona, but I honestly can't say much because you have a lane disadvantage into every champion. The only thing that substantially changes that is the playstyle of the enemy bot lane. For example, against a competent Senna, you have to just sit back and do nothing because there's no way to win a trade against an overtuned champion. But if they suck, and particularly if the lane is slow and non-aggressive, you can actually play. You see, Sona has to play reactively while the enemy support always has the opportunity to play proactively into Sona. But if they don't, for one reason or another, then you get to play proactively, and that's when Sona's laning is the most fun. Sona is very strong when she gains control of the lane, because this means the enemy lane can't force anything. And because Sona is so mechanically simple, there's never going to be a good opening for the enemy to do anything. If, say, you miss a Sona queue, it's up again in two seconds, and pretty hard to miss twice. This is common in norms and rare in ranked, because like I said, Every champion has the proactive advantage into Sona. As for how effective specific champions are in being proactive, there's really nothing I could tell you beyond just check the win rates. In my experience, it's purely a matter of whether or not the enemy laners are any good. A big factor in lane strength is also your ADC. In low elo, I gotta be honest, most ADCs are used to being carried every game, and they're also used to laning with CC tanks and other types of supports that make a lot of space. When they lose that for the first time, they tend to feed, which accounts for a few of my rank losses, but just in general, most low elo ADCs straight up don't know how to play with a Sona and end up making poor decisions due to that inexperience. And to a certain extent, it doesn't matter where on the low elo ladder you are. This is as big a problem in bronze as it is in gold. This is gonna make your ADC functionally useless, and you really don't have a lot of solid options when this happens. A lot of times your ADC is just gonna get tilted, perma fight, feed 10 kills, and at that point, the enemy team is so fed that they can just end the game. Typically, you want to spend laning phase making sure this does not happen. The unfortunate truth is you're gonna have to babysit bad ADCs in like 40% of your matches, so you might as well get good at it. Really all you can do is just keep them alive, make sure they can farm, and look for other things on the map that will inevitably need your attention because of your lane's weakness. The wave state is officially not your job, and I'm really not kidding, but it doesn't hurt to help your ADC out a little, especially with this new support item. So barring the minion execute, which nets you less gold so you shouldn't use it, here are the general rules of wave management for Sona. Don't touch the wave. In most cases, do nothing. If the enemy lane is pressuring and pushing into you, and particularly if the enemy support is pushing the wave, you have to contest. You don't want huge wave pressure and you 
probably don't want them to crash, so here's the golden rule. Get minions to a safe level of HP where your ADC only needs to auto once to get it. Do not waste power cord, do not waste abilities. No autos for a freeze, focus casters for a slow push, kind of focus melees for a shove, but they can be kind of dicey. The real golden rule is nobody's gonna fault you if you fuck up on a caster minion, so take your chances there. If you're under tower, just go fuck yourself, because any CS your ADC misses is going to be blamed on you, regardless of if you help or not. If you help, you are an e-girl with ADHD. If you don't help, you are useless, lazy, elo-inflated trash. Truth be told, with the exception of a few unlucky champions, your ADC shouldn't need help here, so if they flame you for not doing anything, my recommendation is to flash in place and full mute for the rest of the match. Just kidding. Again, go cast minions, one auto early game, maybe two autos once they've scaled up a little more, and you should be golden. Of course, adjust these numbers for your ADC's individual needs, but these should be good rules of thumb to start off from. Remember, be strategic, be reactive. Proactivity is great if you have a lane advantage, but if you really do, you're better used pressuring the enemies away from the wave with your poke. It's also way more fun than autoing fucking minions. Warding is really important, not because of Sona, but because you're a support, and every support is expected to do pretty much all of the team's vision control. I don't really want to explain all that in this video, and even if I did, it's become such a subconscious process that I'm really not sure how well I could put it into words. Doesn't really matter. Wards are wards, Sona wards like everyone else. I guess I could say her autos suck for clearing vision. You can do the reset with your power cord thing, and there used to be some other way to reset with abilities that I don't think works anymore. Whatever, moving on. Sona builds support items. You end up building a lot of things with some percentage of heal and shield power, which from what I gather is a completely fake stat. I'm like 99% sure you can't actually see the effects of it on your ability info. All you see here is the numbers you get from AP alone. Riot, what the fuck? You get some heal and shield power, you build mana regen, a little AP, a decent amount of ability haste, and you're golden. Moonstone is really good, but it's boring. Helios is a lot of fun, but it's kind of weak right now. I don't care, I build it anyways, but just know that this is me being stubborn, not what I consider optimal. Shirelia's is good. In fact, I have an entire move speed Sona build that I'll cover at a later date. You might notice I have Ghost in some of these clips. Ignore that. We'll get there another time. I covered these items first because they were mythics, but mythics are going away or are gone depending on when you watch this. Even so, these are still core items, and right now it's not normal to build all three of them. But you totally could but you shouldn't. The rest of the items are pretty straightforward. Staff is good. Ardent is classic. You need to get an early tier and build Archangels for this champ to be playable at all. And yes, it is a miserable build path. It sucks, but being out of mana is worse. Lich Bane is good for full AP. Again, we'll get into that some other time. The new Dawn Core feels like total shit, and when I use it on PvE, I'm pretty sure it did nothing. I took a bad picture, but those numbers are all zero. Maybe they'll fix it. If they don't, Redemption is fucking amazing. I do not recommend sleeping on this item. Support Sona is the best build that this champion has right now, but like I mentioned, there are others. And to be completely honest, I find these off-meta builds to be way more fun. If you're interested in that, I plan on doing a video on some of my own builds in the future, so you know what to do. Alright, you got through laning phase, you got some items, you have wards, you haven't lost yet, you're getting into the middle of the game and you're in decent shape so far. This is where you get a lot more freedom, but you're also in a lot more danger. Mid to late game Sona is 90% macro, 10% micro. If you don't know what those terms mean, you should start playing Nautilus. He's a lot of fun, he's easy to pick up, I think you'll like him a lot. Once you get to late game on Sona, it's not like there's a button you press that makes the enemy nexus explode. You have to know how to win a game, and particularly you have to know when and how to team fight. Sona is strongest when her team is grouped because her auras can be applied to as many people as they touch, which means you're doing five times as much as you were before, or four times, or some other rational scaler depending on how accurately you really want to model that out. But you get the point. Five shields, better than one. Your Q gives more enhanced autos, your E gives more people move speed, and your R can hit the entire enemy team if they're positioned right. Everything Sona does has some AoE, which makes her a team fighting machine. But you're still really weak, and you will have to to risk your neck to use power cords optimally. Your R range is also kind of awkward and its efficacy relies on a lot of variables. It was a zoning ult. That was for zoning. So though you have a lot more going for you, you have a little more working against you. This is where the real game starts, and it's your chance to actually perform and use the key strategies to playing Sona. The first is being considerably slippery with your E. The enemy is going to try their damnedest to lock you down, but if they're not fast enough, you get a mobility advantage. This is huge, because enchanters are often characterized by their lack of mobility. Sona does not have powerful escape tools. 
her heal, while low cooldown, doesn't replenish a lot at once, which makes gank scenarios very difficult for her. Also, because slows divide all movement boosts, Song of Celerity is far from a get-out-of-jail-free card. Of course, just because you get a move speed buff doesn't mean you can outrun Riot's 200-year champions with all the dashes and whatever else. But you'd be surprised how many sticky situations Sona can escape from. This is a kinda old replay of me outrunning a Riven and completely turning a dangerous situation around on the enemy team. And this turning the situation around is the second key, because when you can outrun over-aggressive players, you can pull them on a string right where your team wants them. This is a plat 3 ranked lobby. Not great, but not terrible. My team is fighting an unkillable Jack Show Diana, but we have a few key advantages. Being our fed Kha'Zix, an Alawi who knows how to exist in a team fight, and an enchanter with a completed Seraphs to bait a very overconfident tank Diana, who for some reason flashes into the perfect position for my R here. I drop exhaust, forgetting that Ukshin can just fly away, but it's still too late. We're ripping them apart. That's when I noticed the actual key to winning this game. This Diana is targeting me because she thinks I'm squishy, which is huge because this means she won't outsustain my Kha'Zix as long as I'm alive, and I have an item that gives me a massive shield if I'm about to die. Knowing that allows me to make this play, where I come to rescue my Kha'Zix who got spotted in the enemy's red side. Their entire team chases with Diana at the helm and R's from both Auction and Zareth following. I know this Diana who I need dead is gonna ape out for me, and I dually need my Kha'Zix as healthy as possible, so I block Auction's R and try to sustain him through Zareth's. And then, at this exact point, the game is basically over. Now I'll admit, I was not expecting this last charge from Zareth's R. I swear to god, he shot like 6 before this, and I'm super lucky here that it didn't proc my Zareth's, because having that still available, combined with my R being up and my exhaust being up, means Diana is dead if she engages on me. And of course she does, because this is plat 3. She pulls me in, my ult goes out, and nobody really does anything because I didn't ward the river bush. So I put exhaust down just to sweeten the deal. Diana dies, the rest of the team trickles in, but it's just way too late. Kha'Zix has too much damage, Aphelios has too much range, and I have too much team sustain for the enemy to be able to stop our mid push, which ultimately ends the game. At the risk of giving bad advice, I have to say say that the enemy jungler is very often a weak point you can abuse with Sona, especially if they're an assassin. When the late game comes and you know they're going straight for you, you can pretty much pull them on a string right into your team's hands using your speed and sustain. Seraphs is huge for this, but it could maybe be a detriment if the jungler sees you have it. At my elo, no jungler is looking at my build, and even if they did, they're not factoring Seraphs into the equation. This kind of weird version of peeling for your team is a trick I've found particularly useful in a lot of games. Strategic Strategically speaking, you're not worth much if you're the only survivor of a team fight. so when you position late game, it's not too terrible to go for broke and use your health bar alongside everything else. You have decent sustain from your W and all the other things I've mentioned. I'm not telling you to int, per se, but I personally like to get into the fight, get a good R, use my spells, and then look for a good death. You do miss out on very strong neutral after the fight, but in games where you really just need to win by a landslide, well, sometimes you gotta play dirty. Don't get overzealous about about this, playing safe is usually pretty smart, but if you practice, you'll get a good feel for when the inting Sona strategy is appropriate. Those are just some of the tricks I picked up with experience and plays that I look back on fondly. The remaining strategies for Sona should be pretty obvious. Set up advantages with your R, play safe and spam W to outsustain the enemy. They're simple plays, but they're really effective, and they're generally what you should be aiming to do when you decide to lock Sona in. Spamming W is fucking boring. What makes Sona fun is playing around your R. It can be stressful, but anyone who has experienced late game Sona knows that even though it seems weak, a good Sona ult is potentially game winning. This ability is like half the reason I played League at all when I was starting out. I do like the Sona changes that Wild Rift has, but you know, I don't really see why the R needs to be a circle. If you want to change the width, go back to the old look. Just make it not look like poop. Anyways, put these strategies into play and I assure you, you have like a 50% chance of winning the game. That's it. As far as the big picture goes, that's what Sona is all about. But there are still a few smaller details I want to cover, because while this is how most games typically go, it ignores a lot of the essence of what makes Sona special and great. Earlier in the video, I talked about how Sona's abilities tend to feel pretty weak on their own, but I would be doing you a grave disservice if I didn't mention the lanes where Sona feels incredibly strong, because they do happen, and while I want to say they're rare, they are the ideal lane scenarios that you try to facilitate every single game. So if you get good at it, they won't be rare at all. I mentioned this briefly before, but I don't want to make Sona's abilities sound worse than they really are. Your poke damage and power cords were designed to be oppressive lane controlling tools, and they are, but the problem is they're halfway 
reliant on your AD carry, particularly in the synergy between the both of you. And I'm not necessarily talking about champion synergy, but rather kind of operating on the same wavelength. And the thing is, this can be a total crapshoot, but when you have an ADC who follows up on your poke using the effect of your Q and lets you safely hit a power cord, your damage is no longer something to scoff at. You can fucking dominate a lane with this kind of synergy, and it really doesn't matter which champion your ADC plays. I've had lanes with Dravens that went at the pace of us scoring two kills per minute, and I've had lanes with Dravens where where we lost. Let's just say we lost. Same of every ADC. If you work together, and if you synergize better than the enemy bot lane, barring unfair champions, there's not a whole lot that the enemy lane can do about it. They're just gonna get out-traded, forced off the wave, and lose at the pace they decide to lose at. If you can find a duo who you generally synergize well with, or someone who actually likes playing ADC and isn't a complete dumbass, then you can avoid the random ADC crapshoot. But you miss out on those very special matches where you get an ADC who just fucking gets it. Matches with you perfectly, you stomp the lobby to dust, and then you never play together again for the rest of your lives. Games like those are the magic that I think keeps League alive, but you know, most matches are just FUCK! Anyways, this is kind of starting to drag on. It doesn't really matter what I do. There's always gonna be some little thing that I think or feel when I'm playing Sona that I'm gonna forget to put in this video. Because playing Sona isn't just about your best ults or your healing at the end of the match. It's about the unique strategies that you use to get all that you can out of one of the simplest kits in the game. An approach which goes underappreciated by a vast majority of the League community. And I think that's fine, you know, Sona has become kind of a champion for one tricks, which is what keeps her pick rate very low and her win rate very high. I'm completely self-taught with this champion. I didn't learn my playstyle through a guide or anything like that. I basically just threw shit at the wall for a couple years and picked up whatever stuck. With enough experience, every little thing you do on a champion is a vital part of how you play, and doing well on Sona requires a lot of attention to those small things, be it impeccable positioning and timing so you don't get one shot, or prioritizing just the right things to make sure those tiny margins turn the tides of a game. You have little, but you can do a lot. And that's how it feels to play Sona.